And what is going on, Man Hour Nation? It's your boy, Brandon Combs, here all by myself right now. Michael Buckheister is stuck on some some babysitting duties right now. Uh, his wife having a night out. So for right now, you just got me until he can join me or uh, until Wyatt gets back from, from whatever he is out doing. I don't know what you can be out doing when you're 10 years old. But it is what it is. So you guys got me for a little bit. Hop into that comment section. Keep me going. Uh, I'm going to hop in and just start talking some baseball with you guys. Uh, hopefully you guys have, have seen it by now. But look, I I saw the what was going on with the, the, the MLB first and second teams. And I didn't have a whole lot of issues uh, with what was going on there. I didn't have a whole lot of issues with the selections. Uh, there are a couple spots where I could have made a case for somebody else, um, but not a whole lot. Uh, so what do we have here? Let's see. Let's uh, go through it real quick. Sorry about that. Um, so we had at catcher, we had Salvador Perez made the first team. Now, I don't have a problem with this at all. Sal- Salvador Perez has been the... Uh, the epitome of a consistent catcher uh, throughout the course of his career, especially with, you know, um, over the last two years or so since he's come back from that injury. But he, the, the guy can just flat out hit. And whether or not he stays a catcher or moves over to first base, moves over to DH, Mike Buckheiser, I see you over here. Mike Buckheiser says, I miss you. I miss you too, sir. A lot easier talking with somebody else who is talking back, but. I'm going to get through this for sure. Um, but no, I, so Salvador Perez can can just flat out hit the ball. And, and he is a very good catcher. He calls a great game, um, does all the things that, that you want your catcher to do. So I, I, don't, I don't know if you keep him there, but having Salvador Perez as your catcher um, right now makes a lot of sense, especially since the second team catcher was JT Real Muto. Um, Salvi hit, I, I believe it was uh, 333 uh, this year with 11 home runs, and JT Real Muto only hit like 260 something. So I, I have no problems with him there. At first base, we had Freddie Freeman and Jose Abreu. Now, this is the first one that I looked at, and I was like, man, I could kind of make a case for Jose Abreu over Freddie Freeman. And I know a lot of you out there, especially, you know, uh, um, Professor, if you're out there listening, I am absolutely positive that you're screaming at me right now. But Jose Abreu had a very solid year. He hit 317 with 19 home runs. That was more home runs than uh, Freddie Freeman had. Freeman had 13. Um, Freeman did strike out a little bit less. I mean, Jose Abreu is just a, a straight power hitter, but for a straight power hitter to hit three seventeen, um, it is abs- absolutely phenomenal. Um, he had more hits than than Freddie did, um, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he had more RBIs than than Freddie did as well. So, I could have made a case for for Jose Abreu, but I don't hate the pick there at first base. Now. When you when you look at first baseman, it's it's always traditionally been a power hitting position, um, and then a defensive position. You really want your guy to be able to dig balls out. You really want your guy to play very good defense. Both of these guys do that, um, so I, I don't think it's a strictly you know just one's better than the other one at defense. But I I, I do think that you could possibly make a case for for Jose Abreu here. Um, as opposed to Freddie Freeman. And uh, 
vote uh vote has opened up over at uh on the youtube page so if you have not headed out to the youtube page definitely check it out here uh the man hour youtube page we have a, a poll going on uh who is better looking combs or buck well, i'm gonna give you one guess on who put that one up there um and so so far right now we have one vote for michael buckheister and it comes from michael buckheister <laughs> So moving on with our with our uh, all MLB team here at second base, no surprise here. You had DJ LeMahieu had an outstanding season, um, and his counterpart on the second team here is is Brandon Lowe, who actually just got traded to the Texas Rangers today. Um, that is a huge trade for the Texas Rangers. The Texas Rangers are making some moves. Uh, they got Dunning from from the White Sox uh, in trade for Lance Lynn, which I thought was a great trade for them. Uh, you you trade a guy who's been consistently inconsistent throughout his career, um, and you get a, a kid who is up and coming and, from what they say, is going to be a number one or number two starter here in the next you know two to three years. Um, so I really thought that they won that trade against the White Sox, and – now they add Brandon Lowe, who really is a utility infielder but can play first base. Uh, the Texas Rangers definitely need a first baseman. Um, so that was a good pickup for them. And, and Brandon, Brandon Lowe gets the nod at, at, on the second team at second base. At shortstop, again, no surprise. Um, Fernando Tatis Jr. of the Padres, phenomenal season. That kid can just flat out ball. He is one of the best shortstops in the game. He is so much fun to watch. Um, when he, whether he's on offense, whether he's on defense, he is just a blast to watch play the game of baseball. I love, I really love players who who play with 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 pride and with passion. Um, and he is just a a ball of passion. At shortstop, I mean the the kid can just flat out play. He can hit, and he's nothing but a leader on that team. And you've already seen that already in his young career. Um, that Padres team is going to be a force uh, over the next five or six years, which is what why the Los Angeles Dodgers are still looking to bulk up and are going after a few names. I heard uh, them rumored to be in on the uh, Trevor Bauer sweepstakes and. I don't know about you guys, but imagine Trevor Bauer in a rotation that was as dominant as that rotation was, and they're getting back David Price, who opted out this past season. That would be absolutely insane. And and that just shows you how much respect and how much awareness that Dodgers organization has for the San Diego Padres. Um, they know they're coming, and, and they're not looking to to relinquish hold of that NL West just yet. Uh, at their base, Manny Machado of the Padres, no surprise there. Uh, second team is is Jose Ramirez. This was one that I, I at first glance I was like, man, Jose Ramirez had a really good season. But then I think because Fernando Tatis was so good that people kind of overlooked what Manny Machado did. Uh, Manny Machado was really really solid this year. Um, and and had just as good of a season as as his uh, partner over there at shortstop did. Machado had 304, 16 home runs, 37 strikeouts, 26 walks, 47 RBIs, 68 hits, 44 runs scored, and 224 at-bats in 60 games. That, that, that was a really quiet, good season. Um, nobody really paid attention. I... I I shouldn't say nobody paid attention because everybody was paying attention to the Padres, but nobody was really talking about Manny Machado as much as they were Fernando Tatis this year. And I think that's kind of what Manny Machado needed uh, in order to have the season that he had. Uh, it was a very good, quiet season for, for Manny Machado. So him getting the nod there uh, is, is no... Um, what does he say here? Chato, <laughs> Machado is better. It's I, I mean, I'm... It's like saying what poop looks. Get the hell out of here, Michael Buckeyser. Um, but no, Manny Machado had a, had a quiet, good season, um, and so I had no problem with him there over over um, 
Ramirez because Ramirez also had a very good season, but just not quite as good as as what Manny Machado had. And then in the outfield, we have Mookie Betts, Mike Trout, and Juan Soto. I really tried um, to make a case to. I mean, you can't go against Betts and, and Soto. I mean, both of those guys were just MVP caliber, and they were both very good in the outfield. They're both very good on offense. Both of those guys for the next, God, man, the the next 10 years are going to be staples in their organizations. And they're going to be the faces uh, of this young movement moving forward. Um, and, and they're very good. I did take exception a little bit to Mike Trout. I, I think Mike Trout, who, who missed some time, and I know he's Mike Trout, and people are going to come at me and say, how can you say Mike Trout shouldn't be on the first MLB team? Blah, 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 blah. I look at a guy like Michael Conforto, who had a very good year, played just as many games as Mike Trout. He had uh, he hit 322, whereas Mike Trout hit 281. Uh, he, had, he did have less home runs than Mike Trout. Um, but he also, you know, he had more hits than Mike Trout by nine. He had nine more hits than Mike Trout. He had more at-bats than Mike Trout. Um, so... It, the fact that his average was higher than Mike Trout with more at bats, I, I just I could have made a case for him over over Mike Trout. I think Mike Trout just gets in there because you know he's Mike Trout. So when you start talking about you know MVP, Mike Trout's name is always in there. I remember at the beginning of the year, the people were like, you know, it's going to be a short season. Is Mike Trout still going to win the MVP? And he was hurt. He wasn't even playing. Um, but you know, when your name is Mike Trout, you, you get some favorable. Some favorable calls. I could have made a case for Michael Conforto over him, but that's what MLB decided to do. Um, your starting pitchers, really, there's no complaint there. Uh, Shane Bieber, Trevor Bauer, Yu Darvish, Max Free, Jacob DeGrom are your starters. Liam Hendricks and Nick Anderson are your are your relief pitchers. Devin Williams, I think, got snubbed in that one. Devin Williams, you know, all season long only gave up one earned run. Um, I know Hendricks and Anderson both combined to only give up six earned runs. Um, but Devin Williams of the Brewers had a really good season for them. And while I'll never shed any tears for any Brewers players, um, he definitely had a good season. And you could certainly make a case for him probably over Nick Anderson. Um, but again, the Rays went to the to the World Series. They were the best team in the American League the entire season. So, I, you know, I get what MLB... Uh, was doing there so all right so we are going to step away here for a quick moment hopefully one of these guys jumps on soon so i can stop talking by myself uh but when we come back we will uh we will continue to chat hit me up in the chat line let me know uh what you guys want to talk about what you guys want to hear and and we will go at it here in just a moment um so give me about uh 90 seconds and we will be back guys we are back got some comments rolling in so we'll definitely get to those here uh in just a moment but i just want to make sure you know guys check us out on the youtube page uh we've got uh some clips going on there some man hour clips uh check out the new one we're talking about uh where, where buck is going off about lamar jackson is trash i don't know what he's doing with that take um 
But, you know, look, Lamar Jackson is not proving him wrong. And so for that, you know, I got to give kudos to Buck because he called it, and, and so far it is going on. Um, and you can't really argue against it right now. So Mike Buck says, Mike Trout best make it. Look, I I get it, but sometimes I, I think that people fall victim to to the name. And just because his name is Mike Trout, you put him up there when, I mean, I mean, it, Conforto hit 322 this year, and Mike Trout hit 280, and so that's I mean that's a big disparity and a big difference. So I just f- thought that you could you know put a I don't know put a put Conforto it, at least give him a, a thought maybe, and I don't know I I would have voted for him. Max Freed is going to be Max Freed is going to be a beast. Adam Barber, you are absolutely one hundred and ten percent correct there. Uh, Max Freed in the Atlanta Braves. That Atlanta Braves pitching staff is going to be very good. Um, so let's talk about the Braves for a few minutes, Adam. Um, I don't know if you're if you're a Braves fan or not, or if uh, you just wanted to talk about Max Freed, but that pitching staff is very good, um, and. It, if they don't retain Travis Darno, I would think that going out and getting JT Rumuto would be at the top of their list. Um, also a back end starter um, and maybe a little bit more relief pitching, but a back end starter and, and then a catcher, man, to lead that that pitching staff is exactly where I would go if I'm the Atlanta Braves. The Atlanta Braves are a very, very good team, a very young team. Adam Barber says, I'm a diehard Braves fan. So Professor Leonard would be uh, a good guy to chime in on this. If, if you're listening, Professor, feel free to chime in. Uh, I know you're listening a lot. So, um, But no, look, the, the Atlanta Braves have a very good young roster. They've got a very good young lineup. Um, as you can see uh, from my backdrop, I am not an Atlanta Braves fan. I am a Chicago Cubs fan. But I'm a baseball guy, man. I, I just love the game. Um, so we have Travis for one more year. Did they did they tender him? I, I thought he was a free agent for some reason. Um, so let me ask you a question then, Adam. Would you would you still like to go see the Braves go out and add Rio Muto? And then I guess maybe either keep Darno as, as your backup or or trade Darno. Um, Cause to me, real Muto on the Braves is very interesting. If you could go out and get real Muto for the next four or five years, not only does that solidify your lineup, but it also brings you a very good defensive catcher, a very good catcher who can handle a pitching staff. And I really, I like, JT Riomuto on the Braves. It was actually something that Professor Leonard had brought up to us um, when we were talking about our top five free agents, which to me, Riomuto uh, tops that list right now. So if you're a Braves fan right now, Adam, do you want to see JT Riomuto? Do you want to see Trevor Bauer? Um, Adam says, yes, JT is the best catcher in baseball. <sighs> Man, I don't know about that. There's there's a kid in Chicago who you could really lay claim um, or, or at least make an argument. I, I'll argue with you all day long that I want Wilson Contreras as my backstop. Um, his arm is second to none. Um, he has an absolute cannon behind the plate. I love Wilson Contreras, and not just as a Cubs fan, but as a, as a baseball fan. I love watching a kid play. He plays with passion. He can hit with the best of them. He's a better hitter than JT Riomuto is. Uh, JT Riomuto is better at framing a baseball. That's still something that that Wilson is is working on and trying to get control of. But Wilson can call a game, man. And and Wilson, I, you the, you can't you can't take too big of a lead off of Wilson, let alone steal on him. The guy the guy has thrown out more runners at first base than I've ever seen. Um, so. I would, yeah, I, Mike Soraka, Max Fried, Ian Anderson, Smiley, and Morton. That staff is, it is scary. Um, it is very scary. But imagine replacing uh, Drew Smiley with, with Trevor Bauer. Uh, I brought that up earlier 
uh, that you know you, you can make Smiley your your sixth man, your long man out of the bullpen, and add in Trevor Bauer. Um, the Braves have the money to do it. Their their window to win is open. Um, they are a very good young team. Them and the Braves or, or them and the Padres would be a lot of fun to watch in an NLCS in a best of seven. I was rooting for that so hard uh, this past season. I would have loved to have seen the Braves versus the Padres, and then the uh, the Braves or the Padres versus the Rays in the World Series. I like. Um, I I really like those young those young solid teams. Uh, the Cubs are another one. the The Cubs offense just it goes in and out. Like when it's hot, it's really hot. Like at the beginning of this you know sixty game season, the Cubs looked unstoppable. Um, their their pitching was really good. Their offense was really good. And then just like you know the last couple of years, they just stopped hitting. And, and so, but. For the Braves and the Padres, that's not the case. Those those kids can can flat out play, um, and they're not looking to subtract. They're looking to add. Man Hour says, "Who cares about framing the baseball? You want computers to ump the game." I do. I well, I don't say ump the game. I want computers to call balls and strikes. Um, but right now, the fact of the matter is that they don't. So right now, you do care about framing the baseball. I don't want to see. You know, computerized umps all the way around because I think it would take too long. But a computerized strike zone, I mean, you see it every every game that you watch. I mean, I, I haven't seen a broadcast anymore that does not have the automated K zone right up on the screen as you're watching the game. And if you can do that as you're watching the game, you can implement that as a strike zone because it's, it's automatic. It calls the ball and the strike right then and there. So... The problem is that you can't you can't just do it for all calls. So you can't just have automated umps all the way around. But for balls and strikes, you absolutely can. I don't like the way that the the umpires umpires change games behind the plate. It changes the approach of the hitter. Uh, in, in cases where you have a wide strike zone, if if I'm sit, sitting at the plate at uh, and I'm up two and zero. Oh, and you call a strike that's about six inches outside, the very next pitch is going to be a slider outside, and I have to swing at it because you're calling that pitch a strike. And that means on strike uh, on the two-and-two two count, they're going to try to set up out there again, and I have to protect. So you just change the entire at-bat because you made a bad call. And in Major League Baseball... With the money that Major League Baseball makes, with the money that they do, there is nothing that that tells me that MLB couldn't make that happen. If in tennis we can come down to a millimeter of a ball being inbounds or out of bounds, there is no reason why Major League Baseball can't get an automated strike zone. And, and it, just, it would make the game so much better because everybody would have the same strike zone. You don't have to, you know, alter for, for which ump is behind the plate. You don't have to alter for him widening or shortening his strike zone. Pitchers won't get pinched, and hitters won't have to swing at balls that are outside of the zone. And it just makes it a, a better game. And, and I guarantee you, people are against it right now. All those old fuddy-duddies who are just like, you know, look... I'm a purist. I just love the game. Look, I'm a purist too. I love this game through and through. There is nothing that that I like more than than baseball. I I, I just don't like baseball. Is my passion. I, I love this game with every bit of my heart. But if you if you tell me that that a consistent strike zone would not benefit the game, then you just don't know the game because. A consistent strike zone would absolutely make it better for pitchers, and it would make it better for hitters. So that's where I'm at with the, with the automated strike zones. There are a few changes I would make or keep them in the same term of rules. There are a few rules they put in last year that I like, but also a few others I would change. I agree. Uh, I did not think that I would like the um, the runner on second in extra innings, but I gotta be honest with you, 
if I'm an owner, I like that. I, I like that we're not going to go 17 innings. I, I like the fact that we can make games, you know, shorter in, in innings and find a winner that way. Um, another one that I was okay with was um, the seven inning doubleheader, man. Look, I, I think that you can shorten the schedule because I, I do think that 162 games, um, as even though I'll watch all 162, actually I probably watch about 400 and something games a year because I don't just watch the Cubs. Um, but I, you could shorten the season and schedule double headers if you're going to make them seven innings, and I think that that is awesome for the game. But the one that I hated and I absolutely hate it. And I think it was the worst rule that has ever been implemented. I think it was the worst rule baseball has ever even thought of. And that is the, uh, the putting, making a, a relief pitcher pitch to three pitchers or three hitters. That is just dumb. You take the chess match out of the game. You take the, the, the sport, you take the, the back and forth, you take the, the, you know, the, the matchmaking out of the game. There, there's no reason why I can't bring in a guy to face a left-handed hitter and then the next guy is a righty, but righties hit, you know, 200 points better against him than lefties. There's no reason why I should have to leave him in the game. That's why I have 11 relief pitchers in my bullpen. So I, I didn't like that rule, but I did like the, the rule, uh, the, the other two rules that we talked about. Uh, Adam Barber, it's sad more people don't understand the art of base. It, it is. I mean, look, I, you know, my, Mike LeBlanc chimes in, baseball season is boring. Uh, look, I, I, I get it. Like, I understand that some people just don't like it. But it, it was best said way back in the day by Yogi Berra. Baseball is a smart person sport, and it's okay if you don't get that. It, baseball is a very strategic game. Baseball is a game of chess. Um, and people will say chess is boring. I enjoy playing chess. Um, so it, it definitely takes, you know, a certain mentality to, to go ahead and, and love the game and, and want to sit there and watch it for three hours. And that's fine. But to me, baseball is like football. On opening day, just like I am every Sunday on opening day, I'm watching a game at noon, a game at three, a game at six, and a game at nine. Just like I'm doing on Sundays for NFL football. And people say baseball's too long. The average baseball game this past season is actually shorter than the average football game this season. So to sit there and say it's too long, I mean, you're wrong because it's actually shorter than football. Is, is football more action-packed? Maybe. But the actual... Uh, time of action in baseball is longer than the actual time of action in football. So I, I just think it's that people don't like don't like the game or don't understand the game. Um, people that want automatic strike zone are the same people that couldn't hit a ball off a tee and need to try tennis. You suck. <laughs> Hoffy, always a way with words, man. I But I agree with you. I, I, I completely agree with you. Um, want to know what else is dumb? Two hundred twenty-six million dollars. Well, you know who's who's not saying that two hundred twenty-six million dollars is dumb? The players making the two hundred twenty-six million dollars, and two hundred twenty-six million dollars nowadays is half of what some of these really good players are going to make. So, um, you know, it's it's definitely one of those, um, you know, give and take relationships. Uh, I love the game. I will watch a game. 162 days a, a season, I will watch the game three times 162 games a season. That's just me. That's who I am. Um, so that that's, that's what I do. So I'm going to go ahead and take another quick break. And at the end of it, it does look like uh, Wyatt is ready. So we will bring Wyatt to the show, and we will talk some some UFC. So give me a few minutes, and we will be right back. Thank you. 
All right, guys, Thrive Fantasy. If you have not signed up for Thrive Fantasy yet, make sure that you go on to Thrive Fantasy on your phones, whether it's the uh, whether you have an iPhone, whether you have a Android, whatever the case is, go into your app store and check out Thrive Fantasy or online at thrivefantasy.com. Use promo code MANHOUR. That's Thrive Fantasy with promo code MANHOUR. They will match up your deposit up to $50. Promo code MANHOUR. And I'll tell you guys, I signed up for this, and sometimes I forget when I get into games. Um, and so I got into a game uh, last week. I, I put in my, my, my picks and all that stuff, and then I completely forgot that I got into it. So I went to go put a, a bet on tonight's game. And I won $175 last week, and I didn't even know it until I logged back into the app. So so that was a, a, a nice little surprise when I got there today. But without further ado, let's welcome on our boy, Wyatt. Wyatt, what is going on, buddy? Nothing much. Just listening to uh, what I think might be next week's What The. Is you getting on the app and realizing you had $175 sitting there for you? Yeah, I, I didn't even, like, I, I looked at the phone, and I went, I went, huh. And then... Uh, you know, my girlfriend looked at me and she goes, she goes, what? I said, I, I won last week. She's like, what'd you win? Like a couple thousand? And I was like, no, just 175 bucks. And she's like, she's like, oh, that's it. And I'm like, it's a, it's $175 more than what we had. I mean, so. <laughs> but, awesome. It's like, it's like the old saying, like finding 20 bucks in your pocket. Yours was just 175. So. Yeah. <laughs> so why? I spent the first half of the show talking about a bunch of baseball stuff. So MLB announced the, um, the, the all MLB first and second teams yesterday. Um, and then we started getting into talking about, um, uh, you know, different players and where they should land. We talked a little bit about the Braves. And then the question got brought up to me about uh, uh, rule changes and how I felt about certain rules that they implemented this last season. Uh, do you watch much baseball? Are you are you an MLB guy? I am, uh, I, I am a decent MLB guy. I know my friends had around. I'm gonna be called a bandwagon, okay? It's funny, actually. I got, uh, I got, got the rep in the team. Oh right? boy! Okay, we we agree on that. Uh, a lot of people question, <laughs> like, how did you end up a Green Bay and a Chicago Cubs fan? I have no clue, honestly. I had a buddy in second grade, um, <clears throat> and he brought in a, a Cubs book that his dad had, and it had Sammy Sosa in it and all those guys, and so just kind of, you know went off what he was liking, you know, and started watching the Cubs games. And I fell in love with Alfonso Soriano. In fact, up in my closet somewhere, I don't know where it is. It's a jersey that's probably 20 sizes too small now. But I have a uh, <laughs> little little first-grade Wyatt Alfonso Soriano jersey that uh, yeah, I adored Alfonso. He was awesome. My buddies all used to get me every year for my birthday. They would get me the next year's tops um, Alfonso Soriano card for him. So, yeah, so yeah. it's uh, – it sucks because being like, like I'm sure you know this as well. Being a Cubs fan, you lose all your life. It's just terrible. Like, everything is horrible, and then all of a sudden you win the World Series. So <laughs> you deal with this loss, and then all of a sudden you've dealt with this loss and you've coped with it, and then all of a sudden you're a bandwagon now. It's like no. I, <laughs> then you then you gotta like plead your case every single yeah. time you talk to anybody. Like no, I swear I've been a fan for yeah. this long, this long, you know. See, but yeah, it's, it's fine. Anybody who ever calls me a bandwagon, man, I just break out the video of when they won the World Series 
and uh, I got caught on video uh, right after the final out. I fell to my knees and fell to the floor, and I was like a sobbing baby, man. You cried? Oh, man, because, you know, I, for me, I became a Cubs fan uh, because of my grandfather. My grandfather, yeah. you know, just brought me up on the Cubs, um, and then all my uncles and, and everybody. So we're a big Cubs family. Yeah. And, um, well, you're from my Chicago, grandfa- so you're right there yeah. with them. So and and then my grandfather passed away while I was in high school and stuff and he never really got to see them win. So for me it was just the the emotions uh, of everybody who didn't get to see them win and I mean no, I obviously for saying. me I, I was happy the, too but Yeah. No, I saw all the trending stuff where people were going to like their loved ones graves and stuff and had the had the old radio broke out and were listening to yeah. the game on the radio and stuff. I saw all that stuff. It was really cool and uh, it was cool to see the community go together. I I, I really enjoyed the uh, and, I, and I, I'm sure you were there. I couldn't because it's five hours away, and at the time I didn't have a car. <laughs> I was, you know, it's eighth grade, I think, seventh or eighth grade. Um, yep. But I'm sure you remember the uh, the parade. Were you at the parade after? Uh, so I was living in Vermont at the time, right? So oh, I had man. funny story. I had a I had a buddy of mine who deals in tickets, so he's gone to Super Bowls and all sorts of stuff. And he goes, "Hey, look, I got tickets for games three, four, and five. Do you want to go?" And I said, you know what? I really, really do. So I started planning the trip. And my uh, my eight-year-old now was only uh, four or five at the time. And he uh, was starting hockey. And I told him I would coach his team if he played. And so he played just because I he wanted me to coach a team. Our first practice was the week of uh, games three, four, and five. And it was actually, oh, during, it was actually uh, the day of game four. So I actually had to not go on the trip because I couldn't disappoint. You know what I mean? Like you can't. You oh can't no, I, I get it as well. Dad, so, dad comes first. Dad, dad comes yeah, first. 100%. Yeah. So I, I didn't get to go to the games, which they lost three and four, then won five, six, and seven. But the like I knew what was. You know what I mean? Like as a Cubs fan, growing up here and, and being at Wrigley all the time, man, you you knew what everybody was feeling. I, I, I could feel the energy around Wrigley Field just watching it on TV you yeah. know, and, and what they what the fans were going through. So Oh, 100%. That's what, uh, it's actually funny because you mentioned you went to Wrigley a lot and stuff, and that's an experience I never really – I never really went to a lot of games when I was young and, and still still don't really get to now because it's, it's ironic because of the big sports fan. I'm, I'm sitting around all this memorabilia here. There's – more over there, I even have an office next door that's got tons of memorabilia in it. Um, but I, I grew up, ironically, in a in a non sports family. I am the only yeah. person in my entire family who really indulges in sports like that. My my yeah. dad does because I'm interested in it. My dad gets involved in stuff like that. But um, other than that, that's that's really yeah. it. It's just so me. I've got a bunch of sports fam- f- sports people in my family but i'm the only one who is as obsessed with sports like i am um so jim tebow says ufc or more baseball uh we'll we'll go with some ufc talk jim tebow um we will certainly get uh get to some ufc we do have uh so wyatt are you a ufc guy at all uh i that's that's another one baseball and ufc are my two weak links uh i I watch them of course uh (laughs) yeah yeah but not 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 so, as following as as I should be. So did you see any of the fights last weekend? The free UFC that they had on ESPN at all? I did not. Last weekend I was working like a mad dog. All right. Yeah. All right. So Jordan Levitt was fatten, uh, fighting Matt Winan last week and knocked him out with a body slam. So he picks him up. That I know what you're talking about. I've seen, no, I've seen the, I saw the highlights. Yes. And slams him down and knocks him out. <laughs> I that saw has the got to be, yeah, that's got to be the coolest way to knock someone out, right? I oh, mean, oh, I've sure. seen all sorts of great knockouts, but to say you knock somebody out when you body slammed them has got to be the coolest way to knock somebody out. For sure, I couldn't agree with you more. That. <laughs> and now I know what you're talking about because I didn't get to watch the fights, but I, I watch all the highlights and stuff after. Um, but yes, I mean, as soon as you mentioned the body slam, it came right to me. Yes, I, I saw the highlights that it was crazy. Michael Buckheister says, best knockout ever. Mike Buckheister is still on dad duty, having to babysit, so he's not able to join us tonight, but he is definitely live in the chat. Um, look, I 
I seen some knockouts, man. Like, so I don't know if you saw the video, but a couple weeks ago, I was showing it to everybody because it was just the, the craziest thing I ever seen. But this guy uh, just hit another man square in the face with a spinning back kick to knock him out, and that might have been the most brutal knockout I've ever seen. I mean, it sounded like when his foot met his face, like he cracked his skull in seven different places. And I was like, man, I would still like right now. That happened like two and a half weeks ago. Right now, I would still be laying on the mat, and they would still be trying to wake me up. <laughs> Rolling around, like, <laughs> yeah. eyes, eyes crossed. You still see the birds twirling around. Yeah. Thing, you know. there, oh, my gosh. There is no way I would have made it through that. But It's like, it's like that those... scene from The Longest Yard where, where he, yeah. he's not on the ground. He's like, yeah. I got that bird. His name's Ronnie. <laughs> hey, Ronnie, you got knocked out. Yeah, absolutely. I so there, there are definitely more brutal knockouts out there. Like that spinning back kick was one of them. I've seen a couple where guys get hit with like elbows and stuff like that. You, you, I've seen some the knee, vicious the knee is it's crazy yeah. to me. How guys the, get the, first yeah. off, like I can't get my knee more than like four. If I jump and lift my knee, we're talking like four feet at the most in the air, <laughs> and, and, and there's and there is no power to it yeah. whatsoever. I have no clue how these guys get their knee up as high as they do and still bring right. that much power to where you can make someone unconscious. That it, it has yeah. always puzzled me how they do that. Right. And so Jim Tebow says UFC would be popular if there wasn't pay per views. I hundred percent every agree. week and do it on ESPN just like football. So yes, look, I, I get why there are pay per views is because people pay to see it, but they also do have free stuff on ESPN every week. The prelims are always on ESPN. You see good fights. You get to see the up and comers, um, and, and all of that other good stuff, which is why I, I like. I, I get so excited for UFC because. Even when you're just watching the prelims, like I get to see guys that that most people aren't talking about, and that's what I like about the sport. I like the up and comers. I like the upsets. And then you also you do get some like last week. I mean, we had a bunch of good fights, and it was a full. It was a free pay per view that was just you know they they do one of those a month. Um, so they do have some free stuff, but the the fights that we saw last week were really good. One of them I want to get to here. Um, was OSP and Jamal Hill. OSP, if OSP could actually remember that he's in a fight after he gets in the cage, he could have been one of the most dominant fighters of all time. But he just seems to lose interest once he starts getting touched. See, and... I, feel like, I feel like the one for me is really John Jones. I feel like if John Jones could stop roiding out and could stop just doing the crazy stuff that gets him the suspensions, the fines and all that yeah. stuff. I honestly, I think he'd have a shot of being the goat. I mean, I know that's like a little far. No, he's, to say. he's still one of the, no, he's still one of the goats. I, yeah. John Jones is a, is, is an absolute yeah, right stud. Um, John Jones is right up there for me with, with uh, George St. Pierre, uh, which George St. Pierre is the reason why I got into mm -hmm. UFC. Um, I loved watching that guy fight. Um, but he's right up there with him. He's right up there with Anderson Silva. Um, you know, and then there's, you know, some heavyweights that make their name up there. Like, you know, you start thinking about, you know, some of the older guys uh, when it comes to that stuff. But OSP, again, he, he gets touched, and he's in this fight with Jamal Hill. Jamal Hill's 7-0 and heading into this fight. He's now 8-0 and because he just dominates OSP in this fight. And OSP looked like he didn't even want to be in there after halfway through the first round. So... I I just wish that OSP would look interested, but I think that OSP is done in the UFC because especially Dana White. Dana White does not take kindly to putting you in a match and then you not performing. And when you look like you are just disinterested in even being in the ring, that's a whole different animal for Dana White. So I, I think OSP is done in the UFC. So what I gotta ask you, man? So what do you think about guys like Logan Paul and Jake Paul coming into fighting like they do? Because I will say I watch those fights and I have my opinions on them for sure. Um, I don't know. I just <laughs> DJ Garcia says GSP was good early on, then he turned into a leg humper. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what do you think? Especially like them challenging Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor, arguably. Two guys who could be considered a goat. Uh, well, I would say Mayweather is a goat, and then 
McGregor, if he's not there, he's almost there. Um, what, what do you think about guys that are YouTubers just considering themselves all of a sudden fighters and getting these main card fights? So, and you're talking about Logan Paul here. And Logan Paul, he's been, to his credit, I think it's been about five or six years now. He's actually been training as a boxer. Um, but I don't know why Floyd Mayweather's giving this guy the time of day. I don't know why he didn't take the, the route that Conor McGregor took and said, look, I, you know, who the fuck are you? And, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. just not give him the time of day. I, to me, I see, I love guys like Conor McGregor. I like Floyd Mayweather. I, I like the showboats. I, I like the guys who can talk and then back it up. Um, and Conor McGregor is definitely that, uh, Floyd Mayweather is definitely that, and, and I like those guys. But Floyd Mayweather's in a no-win scenario here. If you beat Logan Paul, people are going to be like, so what, it was Logan Paul. Yeah, you beat a YouTuber, congratulations. It, if you lose to Logan Paul, you are the laughing stock of boxing forever. Well, and that's what I never really understood, even with the McGregor fight, too, with Mayweather, was <clears throat> you've got this amazing record. Yeah, and why would you want to chance that dash one? Like, why well, why would you want that to do one? That? I understood because of the payday. The payday oh, on sure, that sure, one was sure. ridiculous. You know what I mean? Like, I think they each got some like four or five million out of it. Like, it was it was absolutely insane. For four or five million, I would have went in there and let them kick my ass. Like, just <laughs> <laughs> you know, would you fight Tyson I, for four or five mil? Man, I, I I don't I think I'd be eaten through a straw if I fought Tyson. Dude, that he, guy is ridiculous. Like, he a hundred percent was holding back on Jones in that fight as well. Yeah, the whole the that whole weekend, that was a weekend I did watch, and that whole weekend was just it's just bizarre. Like, you there was there were times where Tyson would just he would swing in, and you could tell he was just kind of laying up as he was getting close because he couldn't hit Jones too hard. He was he's gonna he would have killed the guy. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you just, yeah. We, everybody saw it. I mean, they here's the deal. When they put the rule on that fight, there's no knockouts. They're not protecting Mike Tyson. Okay, right, let's right. let's let's take a let's take a real realization of what's going on here. They're not going to text. They're not going to. They're not going to protect Mike Tyson from from being knocked out. That's not. They're worried about Mike Tyson's lethal weapon hands killing a man. That's what oh, they're yeah. worried about. Hundred plus million is what they made off of that fight. Not even. Oh, it was it was crazy. The, the Mayweather and McGregor fight. For a hundred million, I'll take my chances, man. Look, look it, for for a hundred million, if somebody swings at me, you could miss, and I'm still gonna fall down like you hit me, and I'm gonna collect my money and leave the ring. Like, exactly. <laughs> call, call hey, the loser still want. the loser still gets like fifty yeah. percent of what the winner gets. So I'm perfectly yeah. fine. Here's the deal: I'll take one punch from Tyson, fall down, squirrel around, act like I'm knocked out. And I'll take no, my you'll fifty mil, down. and I'll no, yeah, you'll yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, no, I'm talking about like a shoulder shot. Okay, I'm gonna like hit, get hit in the shoulder and fall down and be like, oh, I'm knocked out. My shoulder hit my hit my jaw here and knocked me yeah. out. You know, and I'm, right. I'm gonna I'm gonna walk. I'm gonna take my fifty mil and go home. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we've got UFC two fifty six this Saturday, um, and one of the th- couple of the things I want to get into. I know you're not really a a UFC guy, but we did. Uh, tell the people we were going to uh, pick some fights here. So if you want to jump in, feel free. We could certainly, uh, you know, you can make some picks and, and see how you do. Um, and sure. uh, so with UFC 256 coming up, it's uh, Figueredo versus Brandon Moreno is the main event. Um, and a couple of things about all of these fights here. One is the Tony Ferguson fight. Tony Ferguson coming off of a bad loss. I think he really needs this victory here. Um, I feel like Tony Ferguson, he feels anyway that he was a big part of UFC coming back so early. He was a big proponent to getting them back um, throughout this whole COVID thing and, and helping them make money. And then he took that bad loss. And I kind of felt for him in that bad loss because he was one of those guys where it, his opponent changed twice. The venue changed like two or three times. Like, but he still stuck in it and still took the fight, but ended up taking the loss. Um, he's going to go up against Charles Oliveira here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take F- Ferguson in this fight. I think he's going to be locked in. I think he really wants this victory. Um, and so I, 
I'm I'm going Ferguson, and I'm gonna say he finishes him. I, this isn't even gonna get to a judge's decision here. Yeah, I'm gonna kind of jump off that one with you as well. Um, all of Ferguson's wins, fifty percent of them have come from knockout or TKO. So uh, he's yeah. also got a longer reach as well. So I, I'm gonna run with you on that one as well. Right, and then we've got a very good uh, woman's straw weep out, uh, Mackenzie Dern, uh, nine and one. She's out of Brazil uh, versus another Brazilian, Verna Jandaroba. Uh, she is 16-1. and one. Uh, Both of them are very, very good orthodox fighters. Um, Mackenzie Dern is more of a, um, you know, a ground-and-pound type of fighter as opposed to, you know, just getting in there and, and standing up. She's going to try to take this to the ground. Uh, Jandaroba has very good takedown defense. But I think if Dern takes her to the ground, this one could she could be in trouble. So I'm picking Jandaroba in this one, and it's probably uh, I'm gonna say it goes to a draw though, I, I, not a draw, but a, a judge's decision. Um, but I'm gonna take Dern in this one. No, yeah, uh, and whenever we look at Dern here, last fight was a win as well as um, Verna as well. So it's gonna be a great match, like you were talking about. I'm gonna agree with you on that though. I'm gonna take Dern. All right, and then um, get into here. You got, uh, you know, a lot of people forget about this guy uh, in the heavyweight division, uh, but Junior Dos Santos is a former heavyweight champion, and he is no joke, uh, but he is going up against uh, a guy who is 6-0 and and is trying to make a name for himself in, in Cyril Gain, and Cyril Gain is, is an absolute stud. Um, he is... A striker, he hits with a ton of power. Um, I've seen him hit a lot of flying knees. Um, and so he, uh, man, I'd like to say he takes care of business here, but Junior DeSantos is a veteran, and he is not looking to let some kid come in and make a name off of him. Um, I'm going to go with Junior DeSantos here. I'm going to say Junior DeSantos uh, gives Gain his first loss. And um, and knocks him out. And I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with Gain on this one. Six and zero. Oh, uh, like you said, the inexperience versus the experience. 100. percent It's definitely there. But when you look at it, Gain has a four inch reach on it. And that is that is huge in the world of fighting. Uh, yeah. So I feel like Dos Santos is not even gonna be able to get close to him. And uh, the the youngster is gonna take over the the vet. Yep. We and then in the prelims we have a. Um, Another female uh, strawweight bout where we've got Tisha Torres. Um, Sam Hughes is stepping in to take this fight uh, after uh, Tisha Torres' opponent caught COVID. Uh, so it, it always is tough for me to have a fighter go up against a brand new opponent right before the fight. Um, you don't have time to game plan. I always think that the, you know, the it goes it leans towards the person who it took the fight uh, because they know who they're fighting and their opponent didn't know who they were fighting until right before the fight um so man i did this last week and i took the fighter who who took on three different opponents and it bit me in the butt so in this one I'm going to do the same thing. I'm not going to learn my lesson. I'm going to take Tisha Torres in this one. Uh, Tisha Torres is a very good uh, up-and-comer. Um, she really you know, does very, very well uh, when she is uh, hitting her strikes. Uh, she, she swings so hard, man. And I, I think that Tisha Torres is going to finish Sam Hughes uh, with a TKO. No, and I like the way you said that too. Torres just so powerful with her hits. It's it's hard to it's hard to it's gonna be hard to bet against her. And what what did you say about last last time you had you picked the three win fight or something? Yeah. So last week, um, it was um, God, I can't remember even remember the name of the fight now. Um, but last week there was a fighter who um took on uh took a match and then that match uh the, his opponent had to. Uh, bow out for injury concerns. So then somebody else stepped up. That person ended up catching COVID, and so somebody else stepped up right before the See, fight. You, so at that, at that point, you just got to cancel it. Yeah, and, and he ends he ends up losing that fight too. So um, 
I, I think Tisha Tisha holds her ground here, though. No, absolutely. And then the the main event of the evening is Davis and Figueredo versus Brandon Moreno. Now, three weeks ago, both of these guys fought. Brandon Moreno looked very impressive, as did Figueredo. Um, Brandon Moreno is very, very dangerous uh, opponent for Figueredo. Figueredo took this uh, took this uh, fight on, and I think he got goaded into it by Moreno. Moreno called him out in his in his uh, post fight interview, said he was coming for him, and, and, and Figueredo took the took the bait and is putting his title on the line, flyaway title. I think that Brandon Moreno is going to be the guy that takes it from Figueredo. I think that he is going to, I, I think he is going to out wrestle him. I think he's going to outstrike him. It may come down to a decision. I'm not sure if he'll finish Figueredo, but it wouldn't surprise me if he did. And if it goes to a decision, I just think that Moreno is going to take it to Figueredo. And I think Figueredo made a mistake by taking this fight so quick. See, and I'm going to take the reigning champ. He's 19 and one. Only, only just one. Oh, 21, excuse me. 20 and one coming into this fight. Uh, yeah, I, I'm taking the reigning champ. Yeah. I see. I, I just think, I, I think that he just went too, too fast. Um, and, and when he took this fight, I mean, typically you, you take two to three months in between fights. He's going three weeks later and Moreno's fight ended so quick, so quick. In the last three weeks ago, in in their last thing, so I'm going to, <laughs> I am going to go with uh, with Moreno here as Hoffy chimes in and says Figueredo has too much power in the right comb stick to writing the bench. <laughs> Come Hoffie, after your name, Combs. Hoffy, that's that's my boy. That's my partner from Triple Shot Sports. But Hoffy, I'm gonna tell you this. I'm going to be watching that fight tomorrow, and when Moreno takes that belt, I'm going to text you, and then I'm going to put your ass on the bench. <laughs> All right, Wyatt. Well, thanks for joining us tonight, man. Thanks for talking some some baseball with me, some some uh, UFC with me. It was a little bit uh, hairy there at the beginning when I'm talking by myself and not having anybody to respond to me. <laughs> so <laughs> I I appreciate you hopping in last last moment. Um, and I, I appreciate it. Uh, we will be seeing you uh, a lot more uh, here on the Man Hour. I know we plan on having you uh, come back on, on Monday for a little bit. And, uh, man, I'm excited for things to come. So uh, thanks for joining. And uh, you got anything you want to tell the tell the people? Oh, come on, Combs. You know what it's going to be. Come on, man. You know what it is. Let, let me get it here. Hold on now. Oh, sorry. We had to let you go. And uh, thank you for joining the show, Wyatt. <laughs> <laughs> and that is all the time we have here for the man hour make sure that you guys join us on youtube on the facebook page every monday tuesday wednesday and thursday at 8 p.m eastern and on big x radio on saturday mornings at 9 a.m check us out have a great night